please standing for the reading of the gospel. The gospel this morning is the resurrection of our Lord taken from the book of Mark, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone, who will roll a stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. So Lord, this morning I, I, I pray that the meditations of our hearts, that the thoughts in our minds and the feelings in our soul will be pleasing to you for what, is, for what we preach this morning, what our praise is to you, and all of our hearts belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So who will roll away the stone? <coughs> now the single most important event in the history of humanity over the past 6,000 years is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from death unto life. Now on its own, the resurrection was a world-changing event, and many people would come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But what about the years and the decades and the centuries to come? Would people inside and outside of the Jewish tradition come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah? And would this remarkable, life-giving event spread all over the world? Well, probably not without some help or spiritual influence. And that spiritual influence was the Holy Spirit that arrived at Pentecost. It was the advocate, the helper. And that was the helper that Jesus promised the disciples would come after he was gone. And John, he says to them, when the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me and you must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the influence of the Holy Spirit has spread the gospel of Christ into every corner of the earth. No other event in human history has had such a remarkable positive impact on billions of people, at least until recently and they have made the world a better place to live. Now, I think of all of the Christians who over the centuries have positively impacted world events and the lives of millions of people. There are scientists and artists and philosophers and politicians and doctors and lots of people like you and me. It was Christians like William Wilberforce and John Newton whose influence stopped the British slave trade in 1807. Florence Nightingale, who cared for wounded soldiers during the Crimean War, went on to develop modern nursing care. And in this country in the 1960s, Tommy Douglas, a Baptist minister and the premier of Saskatchewan, introduced Medicare that is now the cornerstone or the medical insurance program that's across the country. The gospel of Christ and Christian values 
were the cornerstone of Western societies, and it resulted in the most technically and socially advanced and free societies the world has ever seen. But sadly, there are dark forces in this country and in the world, and they are intent on removing the gospel of Christ and undermining our Christian values. Their efforts to coerce public attitude against Christianity it will eventually devour the greatness of our Western societies. Yet in spite of these dark forces, the gospel of Christ continues to be preached. Today, there are millions of people who need to hear about the love of Jesus for them. Therefore, we must continue to proclaim the truth that Jesus is the Messiah the anointed one of God who will soon return to rule all the nations. Now we talk about the gospel. So what is the gospel of Christ? Well, it's a simple but accurate statement of Christ's death and resurrection and why he died. And this we get from Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. And this is what we read. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Died for our sins according to the scriptures, we read. Now the author of Hebrews says this, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed by blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There are numerous Old Testament verses that point to the crucifixion of Christ and the atoning effect of his blood. So for in Leviticus, for the life of a creature is in its blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And in Exodus, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over the doorway and will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. You see, the blood of Jesus has the power to protect us from the wrath of God. And it is the blood of Jesus that we take into our bodies every time we have communion. Now, it was clearly part of God's plan to destroy the power of death that Satan introduced into our hearts and minds through Adam and Eve. Now, a couple of weeks back in Les's sermon, he made the point that there was no other way to redeem sinful humanity except through Christ's death on the cross. And we also read, raised on the third day in according with the scriptures, resurrected from death unto life. Jesus died and rose unto life so that we also might be resurrected from death unto life. And this is the blessed hope that we share as Christians. Now he says to Martha, Lazarus's um, sister, that we will be resurrected unto life. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Now there are also Old Testament ref references to the resurrection, just as there are to the crucifixion. For example, in Daniel, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Psalm 16. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. 
and from Job. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. And how my heart yearns within me, and I think it yearns within each and every one of us. Now there's no doubt in my mind that we will be raised from death unto life. But what about worldly people? I don't think they have any such hope. They believe that this life is all there is, and when they die, they become just so much floatsome in space. They live by their physical and emotional experiences. For them, what they see and hear and touch, that is what they believe to be verifiable and real. Nothing exists outside of the physical world and the physical matter that is in space beyond the earth. In this modern humanistic world, they will believe what science tells them is true, even if it's not true. They will say there is no such thing as a person being raised from life after death. It's not scientifically plausible. Besides, if they admit that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was raised from death unto life, it would destroy their worldview, a world that they are used to, that they believe in, and that they trust in. And then they would have to admit that everything they believed in was wrong. And, I, and in a way, I'd like to see how their jaws drop as they stand before God Almighty and try to explain their lack of, lack of faith and belief when it's all around us. But if Christ was not resurrected from death unto life, then it is us and not the rest of the world who are the fools here. The Bible and all we believe would be nothing more than a false religion. All the Bible studies and all the preaching would at best be pointless and at the worst be a lie. But the real tragedy is that we, we, we would all still be dead in our sins and death would hold power over us. And Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, explains what it means if there is no resurrection. But if I preach that Christ is not being raised from the dead, how can you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all of people most to be pitied. Now why do we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from death unto life and that that is the hope we have? Well, it's because of the Helper, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit that lives within us and leads us all to the truth. Amen. Now, in Mark's telling of the Resurrection, it's the shortest of the four Gospels. And I had to ask why. Well, some of the commentators have suggested that the last part was somehow lost. And it does make sense that there must have been more because all of the other Gospels include some of the things that happened with the disciples after the resurrection and they have the Great Commission. The add-on parts that are in Mark 
were clearly not written by the original author of Mark's Gospel. But for its shortness, there are some interesting statements. He says that there are three women that come to the tomb first thing in the morning. Well, I guess there's strength in numbers. And, in, and Mark mentions each of them by name, which gives credibility to, to his account of the event. So all four Gospels say that women, it was women who go to the, to the tomb first thing in the morning. But the details in the four Gospels are a little different. In Mark we read, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. In Matthew we read, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. In Luke, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. And in John, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. First thing in the morning, the women went to the tomb. I assume they knew the location of the tomb either because the crucifixion of Jesus was such a talked about event or because they saw Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body down and place it in the tomb. Now they may have gone to anoint the body, but this point is not clear in the gospel accounts. The scriptures do not say if they knew that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had anointed the body or not. But maybe, just maybe, the women went to see if what Jesus had said about being raised from the dead was true or not. They would be, there would be that little voice in the back of their head that says, it is true and he will be raised on the third day and this is the third day. Now, all the logic in the world says that he's still dead, but just maybe not. Maybe he's alive. For these women, their big concern is who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb. Now, these burial tombstones could weigh as much as several thousand pounds, so their question is one of real concern. However, when they see that the stone is rolled away, what were they really thinking? Now, sadly, in the four Gospels, they tend to understate their reaction. I mean, was it joy or relief or terror or, or what? It doesn't say. In Matthew's account, it reads this. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now, that is a lot of strength in one angel. But several years ago, I read a book that some of you may have read, and it was titled 23 Minutes in Hell. The author was a pastor, and in a dream, God's spirit took him to hell. Well there, he got the impression that the demons in hell, which are, you know, heavenly beings sort of thrown down, were a thousand, thousand times stronger than a man. Now, at my peak condition, several years ago, I could bench press 225 pounds. So that means that a heavenly being could bench press 225,000 pounds, and that's really strong. So these three women go into the tomb, and they are start to startled to see a young man sitting inside. Well, it's not Jesus. And Mark says they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he says something that is repeated so many times in the Bible. Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. It's like, don't be afraid. And how many times do we read that in the Bible? So God has everything under control, and everything he says is true, and everything he says is going to happen will happen. Now, if the woman were there to see if Jesus was alive, the angel now confirms what they believed. 
He says to them, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place they laid him. In one of the songs by the Christian music group Mercy Me, the songwriter wonders what he will be like when he is in the presence of the Son, Jesus Christ. Will we look the same and respond the same as we do in this world? Well, we can get a pretty good idea of how we look by what Jesus looked like after the resurrection. There is nothing in the scriptures to suggest that he looked any differently. To the disciples, Jesus looked the same as he did before, except for the holes. And because Jesus looked the same, I assume that our resurrected, incorruptible, immortal bodies will look the same as we do on earth. Although for some of us, I hope we're just a little bit younger. <laughs> now the resurrection is central to our Christian faith. Without it, there's no Christianity, and hum humanity would be left with a multitude of pagan and false religions, for which there is a lot outside of Christianity. When we are res resurrected unto life, we shed our burial clothes, and we wake up on the other side of eternity in heaven. We will experience such immense love and joy. But can we really, truly, and accurately explain heaven with human words? I don't think it's really possible. We'll just have to wait and see when we get there. The resurrection is hope. It is hope that we too will be resurrected from death unto life into a new and glorious life a heavenly life of love and joy and peace, no pain, heartache, or stress. And we will bask in the glorious light that comes from the throne of God, and we live in a state of amazing bliss and peace forever. He has risen. He is risen indeed.